Good morning and welcome to worship at Rosemont. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So today is the first Sunday in August. It's Communion Sunday. If you'd like to participate in with taking the elements, I have the communion cups available. You can um, come down and get one at the Performing Arts Center and then take it back to your room. Listen through the liturgy as we do it, and then you can participate with the elements back at your room. You'll see it has a uh, wafer on the top. You'll just peel the top off and then the cup on the bottom. I have a question for us today. Did you ever hear something so many times that you stop hearing them? So maybe you had a train near your house or apartment and you just stopped hearing it go by after a while. Or I've had friends who have had a grandfather clock and the bong, bong, and they, they stop hearing it because it becomes familiar. Today's gospel reading is a very familiar one. It's Jesus taking the loaves and the bread and thanking God for them and distributing them and they become enough for a multitude. Pray that we might have different ears to hear today what God might be saying to us in these scriptures. Our call to worship comes from Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 3. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money on that for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. Our first hymn is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. <laughs> Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may the Spirit of God rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, 
They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. So the Bible talks a lot about bread. There are many stories about bread and phrases about bread. We have, give us this day our daily bread, how the early disciples broke bread from house to house. We have the bread in communion. And today's miracle of multiplying plain bread. Why so much bread? Um, because bread really is the stuff of life, and it's the basics of food. Humans have been eating bread for as long as there's been humans. Now, my favorite bread growing up was De Palma's Bakery Rolls. There's this little Italian bakery around the corner from my house, and the kids in the neighborhood, if they got a little hungry, you could peek your head in the bakery door and say, hey, do you have any free rolls today? And if they had any ones that they burned, they kept them in like a bin by the door and you could take one out and munch on it. Oh, they were so good. Um, crunchy on the outside and sometimes burned on the outside, but nice and soft on the inside. Italian bread. Mm. When you've eaten bread and are satisfied, it is one of the best feelings in the world. Today we get to this story about bread. Bread multiplied, fish multiplied for all those who were there. What does it mean for us today? A couple points. First, I want us to think about how this account shows that it is God's will that the hungry be fed. See, this miracle is the only one that all four Gospels have in common, um, miracles that Jesus did during his ministry. Um, and also, two Gospels also record a feeding of 4,000 people. So you figure there's four, six accounts of feeding miracles. Why all of these miracles about Jesus' ability to multiply the bread and the fishes? So it shows us that God is about feeding the hungry, that this is what God cares about, feeding the hungry, He's hungry physically, spiritually, emotionally, in John's Gospel, his version of this miracle uses the opportunity to teach that Jesus is the bread of life, meeting spiritual needs through giving of his body and blood. But Matthew's version stays much more in the physical world, with this one simple point shining through that it is God's will that hungry people be fed. You see, the disciples wanted to send them away and let them deal with it on their own. And Jesus says, they don't need to go away. I will feed them. It gives us the reflection of God's heart. All of Jesus' work in this world showed us what God is about. And it shows us that God desires that people do not go hungry. God has filled the earth with food. And he wants all people to eat and be satisfied. Such... A simple premise. Yet so many people go through days hungry and lacking daily bread. In the website Pulpit Fiction, it has this interesting idea that, all right, think about Jesus as a revolutionary kind of person, a leader. And if he wanted to be a zealot or a political savior, he could have used this moment. 5,000 people in a, in a remote place angry, bewildered, dispirited. It would make a great start to an army that could have stormed Herod's palace. But instead, it becomes this story of bread and fish multiplied, people satisfied. I looked up some of the statistics on hunger in children this week, and they you can't even get your mind around it, that 
many thousands of children die every day because they are malnutritioned, according to worldhunger.org. And during this particular time, during the coronavirus pandemic, the UN released a report just this week that coronavirus-linked malnutrition is affecting 10,000 children a month. These numbers are impossible to take in, that we as a planet have not fed our children, are not feeding our children, when it is God's will that all people be fed and satisfied. Another thing I want to point out from this passage is this was not a convenient time for Jesus, nor will it be for us. It was inconvenient for Jesus to join, and join God in his feeding of the hungry. See, let me tell you the context of where this story comes in the Gospel of Matthew. Right before this, we have the account of how King Herod killed John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin, friend, forerunner. And Jesus' reaction, it tells us in the beginning of this chapter, was to withdraw into a, to a lonely place. That he was saddened, probably, by this course of events. He's dwelling on his own mortality and mission. He's at a weak place. Yet when he sees the great crowd, he comes into that area on his boat, he is moved with compassion. He sees that they're seeking answers and help, so he heals those who came to him all day long until it's evening, past the time for going home, past the time for getting a meal. Everyone is getting hungry. Doesn't Jesus get a break to go and eat this little lunch? Even then, Jesus is ready to feed the crowd. He rises to the occasion, even though the occasion didn't come when he was at his best. And so so it is with all of us. It's never convenient to go and feed the hungry. You know, you're probably thinking, I'm old, Kathy. It's not time to start something new. I did my part. We all might say, we're in quarantine. What can we do? We're sick. But this scripture is telling us if we want to do the things that God is doing, that he calls us to do, we will look out for the needs of others, and especially the hungry ones, and that Jesus will join us in that work. Jesus was about God's business, even when it wasn't convenient. And for that, it requires some thinking, some forethought on our part. I remember when I was a little girl, I've told this story before, but we, went, we used to go camping in the summer, my family, and I had two older sisters, and one day when we would go camping, my dad would go out to Dunkin' Donuts and bring us some donuts. Um, for some reason that year, there wasn't enough for everybody to have one. Everybody was supposed to split one. So I woke up before my sisters, and my mom said, all right, you can eat your half a donut, but I don't have a knife. Just eat your half and leave the other half for your sister. And so I got eating, and I got eating until my mom said, Kathy, and there was only one bite of the donut left. Did I mean to eat the whole thing? No. Did I get in trouble? Yes. Um, but the, the thing is, if we don't plan ahead to do what we want to do, sometimes we forget. Sometimes we get distracted. Um, experts say that we think we are more generous than we actually are because we intend to be generous with our life. We intend to follow through so much that we think we have followed through when we haven't. So we're encouraged to think about how we are helping the hungry in the world. Jesus wants us to give ourselves and our resources to join him in feeding the hungry. That we're asked to combine what we have with the blessing of God so that something might happen. There's a table grace that some say that I think is really helpful. It says, it's a prayer that says, to those who have hunger, give bread. And to those who have bread, give a hunger for justice. I think most of us listening to this have bread. So that prayer for us is that we might work for justice and hunger for justice for those who don't have bread. Last year, um, during, I guess it's October, um, all of you at Rosemont gave a generous amount to UNICEF, which helps feed children. So it's an example of planning ahead. 
you did that when there wasn't a crisis at the moment and then here we are in the middle of the pandemic and those funds are being used by the united nations children's fund to help children in need finally i want to have this point what matters is sharing what you have not what you wish you had you know the disciples they had five loaves and two fish for their lunch and they wished they had so much more and they could have said i can't do anything because i don't really have enough to share the disciples could have claimed hey that's our food we're not we're not giving it away but and if we give it to them what will we eat so there's this idea that it is god's will that we share what we have and we think about how God could have done the miracle. Could Jesus have prayed and everybody's belly feel full? Well, yes, but that's not how God works. He works through the disciples sharing what they have. Miraculously, the little bit that they had became enough for everyone with leftovers. The disciples wouldn't have dared sharing that little bit among so many, but Jesus directed them to. And so he does the same with us, not saying you can't do anything because you don't have much. Um, Stan Duncan, a pastor, writes this. When I was a, a church, kid in church camp at age 15, one of our camp sponsors led a Bible study in the morning on one of these six feeding stories. At the end of it, he asked, which is actually the greater miracle? For Jesus to radically change those few loaves into an abundance of loaves? Or for Jesus to change the hearts of the people who were there to teach them how to share? What is the greater miracle for us? For Jesus to do all the work for us or for Jesus to change us, to enable us to do it? Sometimes we belittle what we have if we only have a little tiny bit of something. I remember back when I was serving the local church, a woman came to me and said, Pastor, I don't have a lot of money. She said, but can I work in some ways to support the church? And she did. She jumped in and became a deacon and helped share the church's resources with the world. Peter and John, when they met the beggar at the temple in the book of Acts, they said to him, silver and gold have I none. But what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand and walk. They didn't have money, but they gave him prayer. So we're asked to look at what God has put in our hands, not just point the finger and say, how come you haven't done that? And how come you haven't done that? But to say, what has God given me to share? A little time, a little energy, a little expertise, some money, some prayer. If there's something to give, then we give it. Our meager lives and their resources add up to a lot when surrendered to God, when Christ can distribute it as he will. So, Delmar Chilton writes, um, that they said, send the crowds away. We don't have anything here but five loaves and two fish. And sometimes we say, we can't do anything about it. We don't have anything here but old folks. We can't do anything about it. We don't have anything here but enough money to pay the bills. We can't do anything about it. We don't have anything here but, but, but. And Jesus says, bring them here to me. Bring me the five fish and the two loaves. Bring me the old folks. Bring me your money. Bring me what you've got. And Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples to distribute. And it was enough for 5,000 men and women and children. It was more than enough. There were basketfuls left over. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. A mustard seed that turns into a tree that grows big enough for a bird to roost in it. This is what the kingdom of God is like. We bring what we have. Joining God in his work in the world so that bellies can be filled. So I encourage you this week to pray, to think about what you have to give. And don't just think about money. Think about time or energy or phone calls, what you can do to help bring life to those around you. Thanks be to God.
Jesus Christ are welcome here, that your soul might be satisfied with the richest of foods. Let us lift up our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God, for you offer us the banquet that feeds us abundantly and fills us with your presence. You strove against the darkness and the chaos and you prevailed, bringing forth creation in all its miraculous abundance. And now in these last days, your Messiah, Jesus Christ, has emerged, bringing your compassion and healing to all people. Though he was cursed and cut off for the sake of his people, you raised him from death. Now in him you offer food for our deepest hunger. And it is in holding tight to him that we see your face and receive your blessing. Therefore, with those in every time and place, we join our voices singing to you. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And we tell of the mystery that we call faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And in this time and at this place, with these people, we come to your table. The simple gifts which we take for granted. The bread which has been a staple of life. The cup which refreshes us when we thirst. You transform into grace. This meal, which is blessed by the presence of your spirit of power and peace. You bring us from every point on the compass, young and old, mothers and sons, grandfathers, those who run circles around us, those who point the way, welcoming the great parade of your children, who come with outstretched hearts to receive every blessing from your hand. Lord, in this day, we do pray for the hungry of the world, and especially the hungry children. We pray that you would satisfy them, that you would use your people. Lord, we choose to join you with all that we have. Guide us, O oh Lord. And we pray for our community, that it might be healthy. We pray for those we love. We pray for those who are ill. We pray for those needing guidance, for those who grieve. And we pray as Christ taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take the bread. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this cup is the new covenant shed for you in my blood for the remission of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes again. The blood of Christ has been shed for you. Let us partake. Gracious God and giver of all good things, we thank you for your gifts and most of all for the gift of Jesus Christ, who is the bread of heaven, the bread of life. Send us out from this place to be your people, people of hope, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. Go now into the world, strengthened by the gifts with which Christ has fed you. Be generous to others, for Christ has given extravagantly. Live by God's word. Avoid lies and violence. Walk in God's path and never stray. And may God's wonderful love be with you everywhere. May Jesus Christ feed you with his body and word. And may the Holy Spirit confirm the truth in you and fill you with God's presence always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.